So today I'll be talking about uh, green hydrogen, hopefully. And uh, what I'm going to give is a perspective as an academician and what the country has to do. That's all what I'm going to talk today. So first thing is, uh, let's just uh, look into the potential applications of hydrogen. People talk about hydrogen only as a fuel for vehicles, but then hydrogen has been heavily used and we have seen uh, from a lot of speakers since this morning and even yesterday that it can be used in multiple places starting from uh, transportation, fertilizers, metal production and refineries. At the moment, these are the three big stakeholders and we're going to talk a bit more in detail on all of them. And in future, it may come out to these three. Transportation is an expected sector. And of course, the aircraft and sea carriers are also a sector which I think we can potentially look into, including the housing. Housing is, in fact, the last option. Now, I've taken this image from Niti Ayog. The author of this document uh, is also sitting somewhere here, Gautam. So Indian government has classified multiple colors, uh, they've given multiple colors for hydrogen gray. And there is, of course, there is one called black. When we use coal, it's ideally black. And Niti Ayog, I think, tried to keep it slightly less uh, poison, so they put it in the gray scale. And there are like multiple colors. So there are two kinds of hydrogen that people target. If you talk to one set of people, we wanted to move to green hydrogen is a motto. But in reality, can it be achieved? It's questionable at the moment. And that's also what uh, the previous speaker, Professor Rajneesh Kumar, talked about. Can we really get away from CO2? The answer might not be no. The same thing is true with hydrogen as well. But then we can go to this blue one, like where we can generate a part of green hydrogen, and then we can generate the hydrogen from fossil fuels, as well as we can do the CCUS. I think uh, at the moment I'm in for this, we cannot jump from gray to green straight away. I, I don't know if my cursor, like pointer is moving. Yes. We cannot move from gray to green straight away, but we have to go through this blue and eventually to the green. And there are also multiple colors. If you Google it, you will see all colors given and each one has its own significance. And uh, let's not even talk about that. Now, uh, so hydrogen has been used in, as I said, in a variety of applications. But let's take this specific thing, the one on the far right. In 2018, uh, this is the hydrogen mix. The total production was roughly 100 million tons of hydrogen. And you can see that this, this one, the first one is refining. And of course, uh, there is a, there is uh, in, the, in the methanol production and, of course, the ammonia production. There are three major stakeholders. You know, uh, when we look at the whole future, we are already using hydrogen heavily in multiple places. Can we really produce them from the green source is what we have to really think about. We don't have to go and identify a new application altogether. That's my serious thought, except for a few places like heavy-duty vehicles, uh, which, in fact, Nithya uh, like nicely thought through. So this is a plot from the Nithya uh, really the hydrogen production, and then the projections on how uh, India has to go forward uh, in order to go into this hydrogen economy. Here, let's look at the 2050 uh, projection. And there is one specific place which is called HDV, heavy duty vehicles. And uh, then you also see the same thing, steel production comes. Today we had uh, two nice talks from uh, Tata Steel as well as from IIT Madras, where we talked about using hydrogen in the steel. And then there is another stakeholder, which is a big one, which is ammonia. So these three things, of course, the refinery, we are not going to get away from the fossil fuels as well as gasoline like uh, in, by 2050. We're going to keep running with them for some time. So essentially, these four systems together is going to contribute to the major hydrogen economy. And we have to supply hydrogen to these uh, cases. And you could see that at the moment, you see this yellow color dot here. This is the green hydrogen production, which is essentially zero. And it is zero. And uh, by 2050, uh, Nithya projected like we have to go all the way up to the entire 30 million tons have to be produced by green sources. And I'm going to show you in the last slide that it's going to be a humongous and impossible task to do. But then, is there an opportunity or if, like we should just succumb to the problem is up to us. And that's also something we will discuss, right? And how does the hydrogen is classified? On one side, we have the generation, how we even generate hydrogen. That is one scenario. The second is, let's imagine that you've identified a way to generate hydrogen, how to store it and transport it. Like at the moment, the hydrogen is being produced locally wherever it's being utilized, wherever it's being utilized. However, in the long run, let's say you want to use it in the uh, applications like transportation, you have to transport it. So obviously, the storage and transmission has to be really taken into account. And the last part, how to utilize it. Imagine what are the areas that you have to utilize it. We have seen uh, steel heavy duty vehicles, uh, refineries, as well as ammonia production. Those are the four major areas I think the utilization is going to happen. And let me start with uh, generation side. So at the moment, Thermochemical methods are the like well-known methods that uh, like almost uh, entire uh, hydrogen is coming from the SMR that that we all know. 
Then there is a very mature process, which is electrochemical method based on water electrolysis. This is one thing that is upcoming and potential technology for the hydrogen production. The next two are still at a lab scale. And I think including my lab, we work on all these things. But even if I write in my research paper that this is going to be the potential technology, don't believe it. Because for the paper, I have to write it, I will write it. But I think that's not the reality. Those are still good for like lab scale applications, but never going to be in the market for some time until we show some big numbers. Now, I'll talk about this electrochemical methods. What we actually use at the moment in the electrolysis. So there are two major uh, electrolytic methods. One is alkaline electrolysis. The second one is uh, PEM electrolysis, which is proton exchange membrane electrolysis. It's essentially, there are two different tasks, actually. There are two different ways by which it's been, like the whole process has been organized. One uses uh, OH conduction, OH minus conduction, hydroxide conduction, the other use proton conduction. These are the two major things. Of course, there are anion exchange membrane, solid uh, oxide electrolyte, electrolyzers. So there are other technologies which are coming up, but these are the two major stakeholders at the moment in the hydrogen business. And some companies vouch for alkaline. And we have talked to almost everyone who are going to be in the electrolyzer business or who are already into the electrolyzer business or who plans to use the hydrogen from the guys who are going to manufacture, take, manufacture hydrogen. And no one gave which is going to be the clear trajectory. For me, as an academician, I find both are successful technologies. But then uh, they put into multiple options to do it. One is, it can be the problem with the finance. It can be the problem with the technology availability and a lot of things. So I'm going to give pros and cons of each of them. And then we will jump onto the next task. Let's take, if you go into the PEM electrolysis, let me start with the downsides. PEM electrolysis, of course, uses pure water. You have to really use like a pure water for the PEM electrolysis. But then the H plus has to conduct through this, which becomes like really acidic. And meaning you have to build the whole system with the corrosion proof uh, materials. That, that's really an important thing. The next thing is we have to use expensive elements like platinum, iridium, and then the contacts have to be made through the gold coated titanium. So this is an expensive value proposition. Some people say this is not going to work out in the long run. But then, where is my pointer? It's not moving anywhere, but then I'll go there. Some people say this platinum, iridium, and gold coated titanium are going to be the heavy value added proposition. But recycling them is going to be the easiest task. Those are not lithium ion batteries, where we have lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, all in one material. And you have to segregate them. But here, we have them independently in individual electrodes, and it's going to be really easy to recycle. So for the people who think this is a downside, I believe that's not going to be the downside. And we can definitely use it. right? And of course, there are a lot of uh, advantages, which all of us really know. And let me go on to the alkaline electrolysis. The good thing is that alkaline electrolysis doesn't use any of those expensive metals, so the capex investment is very low. And that's really cool. And of course, um, the cost reduction is possible. People talk about cost reduction in PEM electrolysis. I think it's not going to be possible. Platinum is not going to reduce the, like we are not, the metal is not going to uh, go down. The prices keep, uh, prices keep going to go up. Iridium cost is going to keep going to go up. Membrane cost. Membrane is like very selective to few countries, and it's going to keep going to go up. And there is no way the cost reduction is going to be heavily possible. Of course, the mass production cost, when they produce in mass, I think the cost will go down. Except for that, the PEM electrolyzer are going to be like the expensive technology. Whereas alkaline electrolysis, the expensive element is nickel, mostly. So there is a possibility that the huge cost reduction when you go for production en mass as possible with alkaline electrolysis is my thought. Next. The thing is, the, this operates at like a highly corrosive uh, environment. You have to really pump in. Uh, 20 to 30 percentage potassium hydroxide, meaning you're going to operate at pH 14. Uh, pH 14, of course, I think chemical industries know how to handle any type of corrosive thing, uh, corrosive liquids, uh, toxic gases, everything. So the petrochemical industry is operating with all of them. So I don't believe in the long run, although it's been projected as a downside, it's going to be a problem as such. And then the thing is, the most important thing I would like to highlight is that it cannot operate at intermittent load. Now this is connected to the green hydrogen I talked about. Imagine if someone says, I want to produce green hydrogen, meaning I'm going to take from the renewable power, either sun or wind. And this one will take at least 20 minutes to start. You cannot shut down. Imagine a cloud pass by, you cannot really operate it. So the pure green will fail completely. Meaning alkaline electrolyzers cannot be used with pure green sources. You have to go for like supplementing that with the grid. And there is a possibility of gas crossover. Over time, the purity of hydrogen that you generate will go down, and hence the alkaline electrolyzer technology has to be continuously revisited in terms of the membrane quality and heavy maintenance might be required. Might be required. And then there is like you cannot operate at low load conditions. Imagine if you design an electrolyzer for midday operation. 
that is when the sun is at its peak. You cannot operate it at the low light conditions. The reason being, the membrane that's being used in the alkaline electrolyzer has a constant hydrogen permeability. Meaning, it doesn't matter you generate one kg or one ton, the permeability is going to be the same across. Meaning, the crossover, if it's very high, the purity of hydrogen will go down heavily. You will have a mixture with oxygen. So, the partial operation condition is going to be a problem. Anyone who talked about alkaline electrolyzer, I put that as a primary thing. Of course, at the moment, people are not talking about the pure green. That's why I strongly believe blue is an option where the power will be supplemented from the grid, which uh, is obtained through the fossil fuel burning. Right? And uh, this one, of course, is not a zero gap technology. I think this failed me again. Oh, yeah, I could see that. This is not a zero gap technology between two electrodes. We have a few millimeter gap, like three millimeter. That's one of the reasons why we cannot start the reactor immediately. But then if you go for zero gap technology, I think uh, these problems might be averted and uh, possibly we can go to the intermittent operation and go towards the green thing. This is an area we need to really invest thing in. And we should not really be investing our time in making membranes. World has gone far ahead. India stepped onto it just a few years ago and we cannot become Baby takes nine months to grow. No way. It doesn't matter. You get it in three months. It will take its time. And that's what the thing uh, that uh, Dr. Milind Kulkarni also mentioned yesterday. You cannot grow the culture of R&D in no time. It needs time to do. So India needs to be strategically investing its efforts in the research on the things which will take the technology that's available now and to put it into the market. Okay. And we always talk about electrolyzer. And this is a simple map of electrolyzer on what is the entire balance of plant looks like. And this is not a complete one, but some of them. And there is a small, the rounded one, that is the electrolyzer. There are too many components all around. And the cost of electrolyzer, I'll show that in a bit, it's only 40% of the entire cost of the system. The balance of plant is the biggest cost, which is 60%. At the moment, people talk about $800 to $1,000 per kilowatt of alkaline electrolyzer, out of which 60% goes into the balance of plant. 60% goes into the balance of plant. The thing being, you need electrolyzer, that's one component, and we need power control unit, which Professor Junjunwal also talked about in many forums, I'm sure many of you have listened to, because power control unit is very important thing, because electrolyzers take DC power, right? And then water purification system, you cannot dump any water into it. It has to be pure water, deionized water. And hydrogen drying, the hydrogen that you get of electrolyzer, get out of electrolyzer, will always be humid. You have to dry that. And you need to have two drying chambers almost in all the cases, right? And you have to regenerate the uh, absorbed water in those dryers. And that costs a lot of things. And eventually compression and storage or wherever it has to be shipped. So with this slide, I just want to really quickly give a feel. The electrolyzer is just one component. And the platinum or iridium that you talk about is just one material in that entire assembly of electrolyzer. There are bigger problems that we need to really look into. And I just wanted to give that big picture today. So I'm going to talk about two major challenges. Although I've kind of talked about challenges here and there in a bit, I'm going to talk about two major challenges that um, India will face when it's going to go towards this, the entire hydrogen economy. First one is renewable integration. So imagine if someone talks about green hydrogen, how we can even integrate that uh, green energy system into the electrolyzers. And this is a very simple thing, right? We all know, you take a solar panel, use appropriate power conditioning unit, pump it into the electrolyzer, and this will generate hydrogen which can be taken into the buffer tank, compress and store and transport whatever we need. Imagine we design the electrolyzer, let's say for, like we get one kilowatt electrolyzer, and I have, let's say, uh, uh, like one kilowatt panel, right? That's the peak power we can get. So meaning the peak power it can generate in the midday, hopefully in May, we can get one kilowatt. So the electrolyzer can be operated at peak power, at only certain period of the year and certain period of the day and certain month, not, not, not like every time. Rest of the time, this guy is going to be kept idle. Meaning, I think CapEx, CapEx investment is not going to be like wisely utilized. So it has to be utilized maximum amount of time and with at least 80% of the uh, full load capacity. And I would like to give one small information. This is a data I've taken from NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab, of the solar energy availability uh, of the country. You could see that this is like all of them are dark uh, red, and then there are some places which are kind of uh, yellow in color, meaning the solar energy availability towards the north and east are fairly low compared to the rest of the country. And people take this one beautifully and then say India has like uniform hydrogen uh, availability, I'm sorry, electricity, electricity availability from solar panels because it's almost looks constant across the whole thing. Now, 
we have taken the data from MNRI NASA, uh, the satellite one, from 2007 to 2014, and we did thorough investigation for all the states. And here is an example for JNK. Um, and you could see that, although it looks like quite uniform on the right side, you could see that all yellow. And if we, this is average over a month, year, the entire year. Now, if we take it, split it over all 12 months, you can see in January, you can have somewhere between 1.5 to 2.5 kilowatt hour per meter square per day. However, if you go to May and June and July, it's quite high. Meaning, if you go for green hydrogen designed for June or July and install it in any location, it's not going to work uh, effectively in uh, like the rest, of the rest of the months. It's going to be really underutilized. Imagine if you design it for these months up here, you're going to waste the solar energy, of course, unless we try to use that energy elsewhere. And of course, we all know this deficit, day-night deficit that we talk about. Let's keep that aside. So the entire energy management is going to be a serious problem when we are going to go to the green hydrogen business. Serious problem. And imagine if you want to, like, assuming that all these things can be managed, now the risk, the, the energy has to be supplemented from elsewhere. Can it be nuclear? Can it be fossil fuel? We need to work, out, work that out. The energy management, the single, the word, which has been repeatedly mentioned in many of the talks and, and the panel discussions, is going to be the single most important problem. Uh, either it's going to be CCUS or it's going to be green hydrogen business, whatever it is. And we need to seriously look into that. Now, the possibility is this is what I'm suggesting, kind of, let's say, can we couple it with wind? Can we couple it with the grid? And batteries, this seems to be an unlikely scenario, but then uh, when the battery cost becomes damn low, this might also become possible. At the moment, this is not reasonable. Why should I use, like rather, I, I think, you know, where you store the energy in the batteries and pump through all these things to go to uh, this location. It's going to be fairly an expensive business. CapEx investment is going to go up. Unless the batteries and electrolyzers are going to be damn cheap, we don't care about the CapEx investment. Until that point, that's going to be a hypothetical scenario. However, these things are possible. Anything except that uh, uh, yellow one with, without batteries, I think we need to do all this continuous integration if we want to go for the, the hydrogen economy, which will not be green, possibly, because we're going to take grid power. There is also a possibility that solar panels can be connected to the grid. But who is going to use that excess energy during the midday? Can it be used for EV charging during the midday? Again, the word energy management has to come into the play. However, it's going to be blue hydrogen for some time, and that's going to be there for the next 20, 25 years for sure. Okay? Now, these are the, some of the problems I feel we need to seriously work on at the moment. Light and temperature dependent PV electrolyzer performance. If you install one kilowatt panel, depending on the temperature, depending on the location, the performance is going to be very different. right? And the efficacy of the combination of energy storage devices. You take it from the, for operating the electrolyzers. You take it from the solar panel, wind, because when it is, has to come from the wind, wind energy is AC, you have to convert that to DC. So obviously you have to put the entire thing holistically and then try to work out the system, how this whole system will work. Then, grid dependent or grid independent, at the moment, I'm not really in for grid independent. It's not going to work out at all. It's going to be uh, grid, uh, like supplemented only. And uh, then assume that if we do all these things, can grid withstand such a huge power requirement? Let's say specifically in the month of, uh, in the months where we have less sun and less wind, can the grid really take up all those, all those load to generate the same amount of hydrogen that is required? That is also a question. You know, this, what I'm talking is more of putting questions forward. I think this is where just thoughts can be provoked and we need to think about it. And energy management is something that I've talked about. Next one. The next biggest problem is that we talk about electrolyzer, and then I mentioned electrolyzer cost is not the biggest cost. Balance of plant is the biggest one. And then I said that renewable integration is going to be the biggest problem. Now we will talk about some important split between the cost that you're talking about. So the present electrolyzer cost, I mean the hydrogen cost produced by the electrolyzer, electrolysis process, uh, or green hydrogen, is somewhere around, uh, somewhere around uh, $6 per kilogram production cost. And if you look at Germany, like they have hydrogen uh, vending stations for the vehicles, which cost somewhere between 10 to 12 euros, green hydrogen, complete green hydrogen, 10 to 12 euros, right? So what is this cost split? We'll look into that a bit. And then that will give us an idea where to focus our efforts on. Imagine if someone says, I want to replace platinum, is it really worthwhile focusing our efforts on that? That slide will answer. I'm going to thank my uh, friend and colleague from, uh, uh, from, from Nithi Ayag now, who is with LNT, and I'm going to use this slide as well in a bit, but I'll start with Irina's data. That is the present day production cost, which is somewhere around five to six dollars, right? 
And the split, if you could look at it, 80% of the cost come from the electrolyzer. The next is electricity cost. And then the electrolyzer efficiency, everything else is very small. Imagine if someone says, I'm going to increase the lifetime of electrolyzer from 10 years to 11 years. Throw that option out. It's not going to, I mean, of course, it's going to bring in some changes. But where we have to focus our time is these two. Electrolyzer cost has to reduce nearly by 80%. And I think many companies do say that. Now it's around $800. We can go to $300 to, $200 to $300 per kilowatt. And they say it's possible. Of course, if you produce en masse, it's really possible. Next, most important thing. This is something not, nothing has to do with the electrolyzer manufacturers or OEMs, but rather to do with the entire country, like how the renewables are going to be integrated across, right? And we need to like significantly reduce the cost. Uh, so here it's given like 53 to 20 USD per megawatt hour, meaning we're talking about nearly two third reduction in the price of renewable electricity at the site where the hydrogen is going to be generated, right? And that's something we need to focus on. So focus is very clear here. I, don't, I think India doesn't have to focus on any of these places. I think if you focus on these two, I think India's vision of becoming like the green uh, or uh, net zero by 2070 is possible rather than investing in these places. The reason why I'm saying we should not invest in those areas is that we have missed the bus long back. Like the way we invested late in the battery technology, lithium ion battery technology, and uh, we, invest, we are investing late in the hydrogen business and I think we should not strategically invest in a place which is not meaningful, rather invest strategically in the place which is meaningful. Like that's what we need to seriously look into. Now, this, thanks Gautam, wherever you're sitting, that's his, uh, he is a man who authored this document. So this is from Nithi Ayub. So this is the cost of electrolyzer. So there is one which is like 45 percentage, and my, uh, my guess is like around 40 percentage is the cost of the entire electrolyzer. Rest nearly 60 comes from the balance of plant. So can we work on the balance of plant? I think people can learn from the entire process industry. They know how to handle all these plumbing lines, all this entire process. And we have power electronics, and world knows how to do it. I think maybe we have to spend all our efforts. Imagine that 80% cost reduction. We need to take at least like a, one, uh, like a, a 3 fourth of cut in this location as well, or more than 3 fourth. In fact, 4 fifth of the cut has to be taken by the balance of plant, meaning a lot of efforts have to go into that domain as well. right? So India is very strong in that. I think India is definitely a good manufacturing country. I think we need to invest strategically in those locations. Now, there is one more thing. This is about, that's about the balance of plant. Here is another uh, just projection from uh, Irina. So there are two cases, uh, like again, hypothetical modeling here. So there are two cases here. One is, uh, you can see that those are two different electricity prices. The top one is roughly $65 per megawatt hour price here. That's a renewable electricity price. The bottom one is 20 megawatt hour, uh, like $20 per megawatt hour price. Now, imagine just reducing the price, the price can, I mean, the cost of electricity, the cost of, um, cost of hydrogen can go from roughly $5 to roughly uh, $2.5, which is the fossil fuel price range. And however, when we go for n mass production, let's say any two cases you can think of, one terawatt and five terawatt capacity, the mass production will also really brings a huge change in the like a production, uh, the overall cost of hydrogen produced, okay? So these are the two cases Like we need to seriously look into electricity cost, mass production, and how to implement that in the place like that's required for the country. Now, there are other things which I think India knows how to handle it. It's more about policy interventions. I won't talk about this. And uh, storage and transmission, which is still a very uh, vague area, gray area, no one has a clarity. Of course, there are a lot of options available, compress and then store and transport. That's, a, that's a, probably the most viable option that we have now. All of us use LPG cylinders. Country knows how to compress, store, and transport it. I think that's one way to do. Of course, storing in hydrides uh, is still an emerging technology. And uh, pumping through the pipelines, like Rajneesh talked about, pump the CO2, everything down to the seabed. Like even if you work in the middle of the, uh, middle of the country, somewhere, just pump the CO2 into the shore, into the sea. So similarly, if we can have pipelines, then hydrogen shipping might also become possible. Utilization, I feel like these three areas are going to take a lead, steel, ammonia, and uh, heavy duty vehicles. And the reason why uh, heavy duty vehicles are the only ones projected is the following. The battery cost is too low. We cannot really uh, reduce, we cannot really chase that market. Like two wheelers, three wheelers, cars, buses. I think batteries are going to be the technology. However, hydrogen will have its own place. Of course, batteries also will compete. It's, it's more of not competing, it's more of supplementing. Some places, uh, hydrogen will take a, a lead, and in some places, uh, batteries will take a lead, but definitely in the heavy duty side. Agricultural equipment, or construction equipment, mining equipment, 
and, and really aviation, marines, I think those are the areas where uh, hydrogen may take a lead, but definitely not in the, uh, not in the uh, lighter side. Now, I give a quick example of being said all these things. I'll take this as an example of the, if you want to green, like I use the word greenification, I don't think there's a word called greenification, uh, of steel industry. India produced 120 million tons, 240, I've got it from different sources, 140 million tons of steel in 2021. And they say like, uh, we have heard a nice talk from Professor Ajay Shukla, he talked about how the steel manufacturing happens in the blast furnace and a lot of things. If you want to do that, like let's say if you want to go completely green using hydrogen for reduction, using the, the heat that's generated in the blast furnace, can it be uh, greenified with hydrogen? If taking into all those things, uh, so there's a German company which is looking into it, they said, if you want to generate one ton of green steel, you need roughly uh, 50 kg of hydrogen. If that's the case, for 118 million tons of steel, we need roughly 118, sorry, uh, 5.9 million tons of hydrogen. And that accounts to 325 terawatt hour. India's electricity production in 2021 is 1,600 terawatt hour, meaning one fifth of it has to go into the hydrogen production. One fifth of the electricity produced. And now India has the plans to, like the, the scaling of the hydrogen production heavily, and by 2030 it's going to be 300 million tons. Meaning 300 million tons, it's going to be multiplied by three, which is going to be roughly 1,300 uh, terawatt hour. 1,300 terawatt hour, which is going to be uh, like almost half of the India's energy production will be dumped into the steel production alone. And by the way, I, let me just say, all these things are for 5.9 million tons. And I showed one slide, India, Nitya projected it to be 30 million tons by, 20, by 2050. Multiply that by another six or five, and then multiply this by five, and that's, that goes to 1,600 already, meaning all the energy that we are producing now, as per the projection, has to be dumped onto the hydrogen production alone. Hydrogen production alone. And we have a lot more things to do. So is, that, is this an opportunity? Of course it's an opportunity. It looks like we are missing the thing here. We are, like, it looks like impossible. This is where many Western countries really invested in. When it looks impossible, we invested in it, and then, of course, not all technologies will win. Some of them will definitely win. Those are the ones what we are using now. Alkaline electrolyzers, lithium-ion batteries, uh, PEM electrolyzers. So I think we need to seriously invest into that business. So this is to, just to scare people. And what India has to do, that's what I feel based on a lot of discussions with a lot of stakeholders, and I have to thank many of them, a lot of faculty members, a lot of industry people, research park personnel, policy makers from government. We have to really invest in only, like strongly I believe we should not go into any of the deep tech manufacturing of electrolyzers. That's going to be the biggest disaster. Because you take one step, the country which is so sophisticated will take 100 steps forward. And there is no advantage. There is no advantage unless we come up with really good technology. First is, national level strategic efforts, efforts, renewable integration and electricity price reduction. I think this is something we need to focus on. Professor Junjunwala talked about one world, one grid. If that happens, seriously, the cost of hydrogen will go down to less than $1. I think that was a phenomenal thought he shared yesterday. If that happens, then I don't have to store electricity, you know. One side of the world will be having sun, the other side will not be having sun. During the night time, I still can operate the electrolyzer because I can, I use the, I also borrow the word, wheeling the energy from Professor Junjunwala. Wheel that energy from the other side which has sun and then I run my electrolyzer. That, that can happen, right? Next, hydrogen transportation infrastructure. This has to be looked into. And I think this cannot, an academic institute or industries cannot look into unless you're going to compress and transport. Next is certification centers. This is where we lag heavily. Yeah, like there is no like kind of guiding document for clearly saying that this is electrolyzer, I'm going to certify this, there is nothing. There is nothing at the moment. And, and it's not saying to like, we have not invested in it, we have to invest in it now. We have to really create certification centers. And this is something uh, repeatedly talked about almost all the speakers, supply chain issue. So we have to, when you're talking about gigawatts and terawatts of production, the supply chain like the, the material supply chain has to be seriously looked into. And I think that is a national level effort we need to put into. That's one. Hardware side. We have electrolyzer and fuel cell development. I specifically removed the membrane out of this whole show. I, say, I, I repeatedly say there's no use of investing in membranes now. But then we can, India is very strong in metal, metals. I think we can invest in the bipolar plates, the entire balance of plant and optimization. And the next thing is that we can work on failure mechanism and postmortem and forensics. Like batteries, 20 years ago, you have heard a lot of battery explosions, like mobile phone, some guy was charging and left it uh, next to him doing, uh, while he was sleeping and the guy died. This happened and now it's not happening because we have learned quite heavily from that. 
Similarly, now we have to do the same thing, understand the hardware side. Same thing, accelerated testing protocols. And can we go for automation of all the things? I think India is good at manufacturing. Finally, the most important data-driven things. Can we identify the faults and prevent the faults upfront? And of course, we have to work on machine learning, artificial intelligence, in order to predict the performance, safety, and health of these electrolyzers or hydrogen infrastructure better. And there is a great uh, proposal call from DST and uh, IIT Madras and Research Park. We are looking for partners. If you are an uh, industry uh, in academia looking for looking to work on this grand mission that government is going into, uh, please do talk to me. Here's my QR code. Thanks.